Have you heard of hyperbaric therapy? If you want better circulation, oxygenation, or respiration, turn up the volume. Everyone appreciates the increased energy and clarity. Athletes, say goodbye to those PRs because you're going to blast So how does it work? We load your body with oxygen. That means less inflammation, fewer allergies, faster healing, and more. Come see us, 1200 Executive Parkway. You know, the Upside Down Building. Call us, 541-636-3278. That's 541-636-3278. We have some incredible deals. Heal, build, and thrive with With New Leaf Hyperbarics. Got air? Finally, a source of raw, real, and honest information on healthcare issues that matter most. Welcome to BS Free MD. From the latest medical information to how to stay sane as a doctor or a patient, no subject is taboo, no BS is allowed. Now, let's welcome your hosts, Doctors May and Tim Heinmarsh. All right, welcome back to BS Free Empty. Uh, today we are super excited to have Dr. Peter McCullough back with us, a man who needs really no introduction. We know that soldiers wear fatigues, but some warriors wear white coats, and he is definitely a white coated warrior for medical freedom. Absolutely. Um, this was a great uh, uh, episode with him, and you're going to love what we cover. We talked with him on a wide range of controversial topics. And when he started with talking about vaccines, how the number of vaccines has gone up immensely, even over our kids' lifetime, uh, the rise of autism, chronic illness. And then we actually moved over and talk about um, the hypersexualization of society and transgender medicine and what we're injecting into kids now, as far as not just vaccines, but hormones. So lots to think about a great conversation with him. We are We're open and honest on our thoughts and let it out all on the line. And I think you will really like this episode. Okay. Dr. Peter McCullough, thank you for joining us again on BS Free MD, a man that truly needs no introduction. If James Brown was the hardest working man in show business, then uh, Dr. Dr. Peter McCullough is the hardest working man in medicine, I swear. I think so. Medicine showbiz. So it's funny how, you know, we're doctors, but now we're in showbiz. I just finished with a a busy group of patients today and all kinds of issues that come up. But boy, what the world has changed in the last three years, that's for sure. It, Mm -hmm. it, It sure has. And sometimes I wonder if it's changed or if we just saw what was going on that we didn't realize until the bloody scab was pulled off of what COVID was and kind of laid bare what's been going on with our medical colleagues, the, you know, pharmaceutical industrial complex ad, not et cetera, et cetera. What do you, what do you think the next uh, foreground is in, in medical freedom? Well, well, you know, just to recap though, over the, the decades, you know, what I would say, this would be an example. Let's say in the 1990s, a pharmaceutical uh, company would say, Dr. McCullough, we've got a group of doctors coming up for dinner do you want to give a lecture on cholesterol? And I'd say, sure. So I would just show up and I'd show some of my research, my slides and uh, on cholesterol. Then uh, about 10 years later, if I got that same call, they'd say, well, Dr. McCullough, um, uh, you know, you, you'll need to follow the slides that we give you. No, I, no, I tell you what, I, I, uh, you need to submit your slides to us and um, uh, we may want to put in some of our slides then another 10 years later, they say, you need to follow our slide deck uh, without any deviations. So just over time, the pharma got more and more of a stranglehold over original thought in medicine. And then other things were happening that I wasn't paying attention to. And I honestly, when I was born, uh, we had the oral polio vaccine and diphtheria, tetanus and pertussis and smallpox. That's it. There wasn't any measles, mumps, rubella, because we got mumps as a kid. Measles shot didn't exist. And then the um, rubella came later on. I remember the big, when I was a kid, a big rubella vaccine campaign. Now a kid today faces, before COVID, faced 72 shots. Now with the COVID shots, if they're taken every six months, we're close to 100 shots. So it's skyrocketed. And, you know, what really caught me by surprise is how the whole vaccine industry got so far without prospective, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials for higher outcomes. So they have very, very minimalistic studies just showing a 
like a modest rise in antibodies against something, and, and then, a, then a shot gets approved. Uh, so one of the most egregious examples is hepatitis B vaccine. Hmm. Now, I, I took hepatitis B vaccine because I'm a cardiologist. I'm working with blood tests and needles and scalpels and stuff. But, uh, you know, you know, now the standard has been, I think, since about the mid-1990s, uh, every child born in the United States gets vaccinated on day one with the hepatitis B vaccine. And the only clinical indication is actually an IV drug abusing mother who's actively having hepatitis B. You have to, to try to prevent vertical transmission. So what I'm telling you is the vaccine schedule has gotten out of control. And now that ASEP, the CDC panel, has added the COVID-19 vaccine to the panel, everyone's saying, wait a minute, what did these guys recommend before? Let's take yep. a look at this. No, that's exactly right. Uh, when we really got red-pilled, was when they started recommending it for kids. Mm -hmm. That was when we were like, this doesn't make sense. They don't get COVID. Mm -hmm. They don't appear to transmit mm -hmm. it. When they get it, they don't get very sick. I mean, we had worked almost exclusively in outpatient respiratory clinics. So we had done COVID uh, in, in uh, you know, big, big medicine, so to speak. And in small town medicine, we had seen everything. We had treated patients with monoclonal antibodies on and on and on. Kids just never got significantly ill. So when they recommended that vaccine, I was like, whoa, something is up. Wow. This doesn't make sense. And then I totally agree with you. It's like anyone that would recommend an experimental vaccine for infants, you shouldn't listen to any of their advice about anything is well, the way we, I think we, of it. Yeah, well, Tim, what would be fair is just to review the evidence. So what I've said is, okay, this isn't my field. I took all the shots. My kids took all the shots. I didn't skip a single one. So I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Um, now, I am vaccine risk aware. I am now aware of the risks, but going over the data. So, for instance, for diphtheria and pertussis, all the major outbreaks, the kids are vaccinated, or at least yeah. have. So, it doesn't really work. Uh, diphtheria and pertussis, it's treated with a Z pack. I mean, it's not a big deal. Tetanus, um, you know, although the tetanus vaccine uh, would be uh, helpful for neonatal tetanus, which can happen from a clostridial infection for tetanus vaccination, let's say in a mother, it doesn't help. You know, when you get a deep wound and you go to the ER to give you a tetanus shot, that's for the next time. It's not for, it's not for that yeah, infection. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, that's a little uh, out of order. And then we look at measles and mumps, all the major outbreaks recently published, about half the people are vaccinated. So those don't work. Uh, rubella is interesting. Rubella uh, that one's, you know, there were 20,000 cases of congenital rubella before the vaccine. We're down to about two cases. But interestingly, the kids who actually survived in the 60s and actually had congenital rubella and they, you know, survived to delivery, uh, a certain percentage of them had autism, you know, recognized in the 1960s. Uh, it just kind of put that as a placeholder. So we have rubella. Now, rubella is really only needed for women as they approach childbearing, but instead, it's blanketed on everybody. Again, even little boys don't get, get to German measles. So, uh, or they get basically a drippy nose. So, you know, our, our big ones that we look at, um, Haemophilus influenza B, uh, do, do you know in, in the last several years, uh, there's only been a few dozen cases of, of Haemophilus serotype B uh, infections in the United States. And again, about three quarters are fully vaccinated. So, uh, you know, these are very disappointing vaccines. So, you know, what people have said is, listen, sanitation got better, yep. uh, living conditions got better. The vaccines may not have actually been responsible for all this. You know, a vaccine given way back in childhood, people don't take shots when they get older. It's hard to imagine that they do much. So uh, we have a situation now where on efficacy, the vaccine schedules is really falling apart uh, based on the data. And there is a worry now, based on these vignettes that are being described, especially multiple shots, what I call hypervaccination, of febrile seizure, and then the child from that point in time takes on the characteristics of autism. Well, it, it really is amazing. And, the, you know, the other thing I just kind of sparked into my mind is the when you look at sort of the dawn of vaccination and, you know, uh, back to polio, okay, you know, we had this vaccine for polio. And you can debate how much it worked, but, you know, it apparently worked and now we don't have polio. So let's just assume that that was the vaccine. And then let's assume smallpox was the vaccine that took care of that. And, well, 
the, we don't use those vaccines anymore. Like any of the, if we assume vaccines changed all these diseases from the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, not a single one of these vaccines is used in the childhood vaccination schedule anymore. These are, these are, there's no, they're not live vaccines. They're inactivated vaccines. They're completely different. And they really haven't been studied against inert placebos. They've been studied against other vaccines. So it really is crazy town science. Like it might be great. I don't know. But have we traded infectious disease for chronic illness? And I would contend absolutely we have. Why? Because of vaccines, because of terrible diets, because of killing our microbiome with antibiotics. I don't know. Probably everything. Well, let's take a look at that. Uh, first observation is when I was a child, the rate of autism was one in 10,000. Now it's one in 36. Uh, there is no childhood disease that's rising this rapidly. This is the epidemic. The epidemic is autism. It, it is swallowing us whole as a society and ranges from completely 24 by 7 care, shouting uncontrollably, uh, you know, going to be homebound for life. Uh, to autistic spectrum where the kids are are mainstreamed, so it's quite a it's quite a spectrum. There is increased detection for sure, but but one in ten thousand to one in thirty six. And you know what's interesting is there are now studies that are, that are being done and being reported of going natural, that is taking no shots. And what happens there? And what we know papers by Hooker, Miller, and Thomas all show going natural, markedly lower rates of uh, asthma, allergic dermatitis, need for tympanostomy tubes, pharyngitis, um, uh, lower rates of uh, attention deficit disorder, autism, dramatically. So in the contemporary world where you know living conditions are much better, what have you, you can flip it around and just say, listen, the outcomes look way better if you skip all the vaccines. Well, what, what's I just going to say horrifying to me, though, is this trend, especially with, you know, Paul, we had Paul Thomas on our show. We we um, talked to him quite a bit. But if you're giving patients informed consent, whether it's for anything else, I mean, what you decline chemotherapy for in stage illness or p patients say, no, I don't, uh, this is the risks and benefits. I don't want to do it. Well, for I guess you can make the argument for kids. It's it's kids, so you, the parents are making a decision for someone else, but it's still their parent. And my point is, if parents have the informed consent of the risks and benefits of the vaccine and choose to not vaccinate because of this trend that we're seeing, um, what's happening is not only you know the parents somewhat get side pill, red pilled, but the physicians, as in the case of Paul Thomas, are getting their licenses pulled just for presenting this information, this data. Four days. Four, four days is how long it took. When when Paul Thomas's book came out, The Safer Vaccination Method or whatever it was called, I can't remember. Apologies to, to Paul. It took four days for the state of Oregon to remove his license. I told him that the only other person that I had actually known and worked with that lost his license was sexually abusing nurses over a series of years. And it took three years and three presentations to the board before they finally pulled his license. His jaw hit the floor. There's something about vaccines. Uh, you know, I'm working with historian John Leake. Some people think he's the world's greatest historian right now. I'm really blessed to have him be the co-author on my book. And John thinks this goes back 150 years, probably to Louis Pasteur, uh, you know, Edward Jenner, that somehow the mindset was that the human body is inherently frail and it's susceptible and that it can be made better. Mankind can make the human body better through vaccination. It's considered one of the greatest achievements. And uh, you know, everybody needs to do this. Uh, it's for the herd. It's yeah. the one time you do something that's really for everybody else. And it was all these built-in assertions that for sure they stop disease, for sure they stop transmission, and you know, on and on and on. And then when diseases went away, people said, aha, see, the, the polio vaccine works just as you pointed out. So it may just be true, true, and unrelated. You know, we don't have a polio epidemic now, but we have an epidemic of autism. And boy, uh, when Andy Wakefield in the UK just even suggested that we should space out the vaccine so the kids aren't hyper vaccinated, he was destroyed. He lost his career. He got vicious letters from the Royal College. You mentioned Paul Thomas losing his license. It seems, and this is before COVID-19, if anybody went against this vaccine 
ideology. It, 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 they were just destroyed. Now we're, we're starting to see data that's fairly incontrovertible. I, I uh, just reviewed an interesting paper on my uh, Substack. Will be coming out shortly, uh, describing that like, again the congenital rubella syndrome as you know manifesting some autistic characteristics. Now the current rubella vaccine is a live attenuated vaccine. Maybe some children actually do get a subclinical. Uh, German measles form of uh, encephalitis, or at least they get a, a cytokine-mediated febrile seizure. You know, th there's about 80 papers in the peer-reviewed literature now describing the relationships. To me, what's most compelling is the vignettes. The, the kids get a battery of, of, ta of shots. We don't know which one it is. All they know is they get really sick afterwards. A few days, they have a seizure. Now, some kids actually die with the seizure, and that's been reported uh, uh, on my Substack as well. I'm just, you know, citing. I have all the citations there. Some die with the with the uh, battery of tests, uh, but others change, and the mothers can tell from that point forward. The eye contact's not the same. They don't suckle the same. They respond to acoustic stimuli differently, and they take on the characteristics of autism or attention deficit disorder or tic de la row. Or there's a whole series of these behavioral disorders that seem to start there. And they're called ESSENCE, E-S-S-E-N-C-E. -S -S -E -E. That's the acronym, ESSENCE Disorders, and autism is one of them. So, you know, I have to tell you, I think that is in the background, uh, and I didn't see it coming. Then, as we reviewed on your show, COVID-19 comes in. There's active suppression of any early treatment, railroading the country into mass vaccination, railroading the world into experimental genetic mass vaccination. It's been a debacle uh, they've caused unprecedented injuries, disabilities, and deaths. The vaccines didn't even work. Now there's legal cases all over. And meantime, what was going on behind the scenes is in 2021, the American Medical Association put out a, a communication and says, you know what? Physicians should not put the gender on the birth certificates anymore. Yeah. We we know it. I mean, <sighs> we started to see it in clinic, I remember. And I started. It, it really, I, I, for I, us, I got so ticked when you started I said, seeing this. When was this, May? This was almost ten years ago, actually. What? When we started seeing it in our the, clinical practice. Not the uh, not allowing to put the gender in the. the no, not not the not allowing, but just that whole, the whole movement of you know you you'd see certain people usually profoundly mentally ill, and they would have a different pronoun every single time you saw them. No, as as far as a blanket policy in, at work for the or companies we were working, I think it started, I know it started around 2019 at the, one of the places we were at in 2019. And all this, I called it propaganda, came through or we had to do updated, it's not CME, but legal, a, annual legal medical training for the organization by a computer training that started with um, doing LGBTQ training, gender training, terminology for all of this. And um, I gave a lot of pushback that did not get received well. But um, let's just say that's yes. when we started seeing it. And so then I, you know, I lo lost my lid because I said, what I need to know the actual sex of the patient at birth on the chart because it affects my decision making if you come in with abdominal pain and i think <laughs> that you're a man but you really have ovaries mm. there and you've got a you know a rupture you know an ovarian cyst uh yeah that's a problem well, but, and, you know, this is what was going on i wasn't paying attention myself but uh you know about um gosh i don't know about 10 or 15 years ago van der Meesen and colleagues published from the netherlands they, they were doing gender change clinics ahead of us, they reported about 20% of their clientele coming in, young kids, you know, teenagers, they had autism. They had autism. And, you know, autism, that's the clinical diagnosis. The autism spectrum is much uh, wider. They had other neuropsychiatric diseases as well. Then a paper was done, is published in uh, Nature um, Communications by Warrior and colleagues, 600,000 people. And they studied uh, LGBT transgender for, uh, who are already in this new gender realm. And they, they tested them for autism and they scored off the Richter scale for artistic capability. So there's been paper after paper now. So what I'm telling you is the reason why we didn't have much transgender activity when we were kids, uh, is we didn't have much autism. And the reason why we have so much of it now is Autism is driving this. You can imagine the autistic kid who's mainstream, 
Uh, they're not fitting in too well. They're struggling. They have some gender dysphoria. That's the new clinical diagnosis. And they're suggestible. And the counselor says, well, maybe you should change your gender. And as you know, in some states, once that happens, the parents don't even know about it. And then things start happening. In Canada, just north of you, they just recently voted that they would criminalize a parent yeah. if they tried to stop the child on their gender journey. Yeah, we've seen that. I, that's an interesting thought process that it is more tied to autism. I haven't really read or heard that. I my like I'll, I won't abandon that thought because I just think as our thoughts have evolved, you know, initially as autism started to rise and people started speaking out about vaccines, I was like, eh, you know, I don't know, maybe it's just correlation, something happened. Well, it's and changing it, definitions. You know, you became it, it was a spectrum before right. autism was severely disabled kids and then you know now they're on american idol kind of thing you know you got asperger's i mean like all the stuff that i don't really know how but to we define would, you know at first it was like yeah the vaccines really caused this maybe it's this correlation that the mom's seeing it at this time of life and then it started to rise and then we were like maybe we're just getting better at diagnosing or putting a name to it but then we but then as we started to see more patients and as the years have evolved i'm like there did when we went to school there there would be a few we called them handicapped special needs kind of kids. Now it's like ridiculous the amount of severely autistic kids that we're seeing like in clinic personally and in the well, neighborhood and wherever you live. And as so as a physician, I'm like, there's definitely something going on. Oh, totally. There's something going on. It's not well, just, it's not just, just, just better ask, labeling. Yeah. Just ask people at one of the couple of recent events. I had a big one in Clay Clark. I just asked people, let's have a show of hands. How many of you are touched by autism? Either family member, somebody in your circles, about a third of people raise their yep. hands. Right. It's 100%. about a third. And, uh, you, you know, the, the literature was coming about, again, autism driving transgenderism, these kind of two modern day epidemics. And then it came full circle and was confirmed because, uh, you know, multiple states are passing legislation to ban transgender hormones and surgery in the youth and Georgia, Texas being one of them. And then do you know who's opposing the legislation very strongly? They came out with position statements, the Autism Advocacy Network. Interesting. So the people with autism, they want transgender medicine. They've confirmed this. Well, the thing that still blows my mind absolutely to smithereens with regards to the the, the trans stuff and into this the, the autism world is – uh, why are why are not gay people freaking out about this? Because it's like you can't be gay. You you played with dolls. Maybe you're just a gay kid and you're going to grow up to be a happily married gay man. But you can't be that. Now you have to, you know, cut your genitals off, get mutilated and become a woman like that just seems insane to me. If I was in the homosexual community, I'd be like, come on, man, like you're just you're mutilating gay like gay people. And and and. And it just and then on the other side, if if a grown man who's not completely transitioned can go into a spa naked and he still has all of his man bits. And so his his dysphoria and mental illness trumps the absolute horrific experience that all these women are having in the all women spa. I just saw that case. I think it's out of Ohio. And you just go, well, then it doesn't matter if you transition, if you don't have to transition to go to women's things, then none of this matters. So where's the women's movement? Where's like, this is the war on women. It's like now creepy guys can invade women's spaces. That That's like, that's the war on women. Women's rights and gay rights should be freaking out about this stuff. Well, it's interesting. You're right. You don't see that because, again, people lump them together. Remember, I think it was Obama started doing that, you know, LGBTQ or, or Hillary Clinton. I remember that the letters just kept growing. Well, this is what we've learned is that there is transgenderism in children, which is really d d distorting. Uh, you know, a recent um, uh, American Board of Family Medicine board exam review question said, you have a 10-year-old boy and he has gender dysphoria. The next important step is start puberty blockers, believe it or not. I mean, that's uh, so that's now being taught as, as good medicine. And, and obviously, this didn't even occur five years ago. Suddenly, it's good medicine. So you have this going on. Uh, virtually every academic medical center in the United States has gender change clinics and surgery programs. 
including Duke. Uh, I checked my alma mater, UT Southwestern in Dallas. These came up out of nowhere. So you have transgenderism uh, in the youth, which, uh, which is concerning because it's irreversible. The hormones after about a month, are, it's irreversible. The surgeries, obviously, the mastectomies of kind of young, growing breasts, all the breast tissues removed. I've seen patients like this in my clinic, and they, they scrape off every bit of breast tissue. It's just, it's really tight. It's a tight line. It can't even be, uh, you know, reworked for a mastectomy. And then uh, the, the surgeries are really uh, distortional. What they're doing in men is they're doing a, a penile inversion vaginoplasty. And if that sounds bad, it is bad. Tim, I'm telling you, they take a male penis and they fillet it open, they scrape it out, and then they they invert it. They make it a vagina. It's brutal. Um, remove the testicles at the same time. In women, there's two major surgeries. One is the phalloplasty. And that's where you carve out a big hunk of the leg or the forearm and try to make a, a it looks like a sausage side penis. Um, it's not really functional. Uh, or the other thing is called a metidioplasty, and that's just trying to make the clitoris larger, makes it about as big around as a as a cocktail weenie. So I can tell you that these surgeries are a disaster. They have tons of complications. They fail. Um, they don't improve any sexual enhancement. So you have this going on in children. 80% of the, the these uh, transgender clinical programs um, sterilize the kids and uh, they increase the psychiatric burden of disease. And a paper by Jackson and colleagues from the UK shows that they increase mortality, homicide, suicide, and death from other causes. So in the youth, it's, you know, transgender medicine is bad medicine. Every academic medical center somehow got into it. They're being shut down. Can you imagine? They, they shouldn't have to shut down transgender medicine programs because no good doctor would do that. The, the, well, the law yeah. has to step in. Now, but, but what's going on in the gay community is something different. And I've been studying this. What happened is in 2016, Obamacare said that gender affirming surgery must be covered by Medicare, Medicaid, or commercial insurance. So 2016, it was game on for any guy who wanted breast implants. And I can tell you, uh, what happened was an absolute bonanza of basically gay guys getting breast implants. And I'm some papers summarized on my Substack. 95% of the guys get it paid for. And so what they do is they dress up as pretty girls. And a lot of guys can look like pretty girls. They get breast implants, but they have fully functional male genitalia and testicles. They don't mess with that. A lot of them don't even take hormones. And then what they do is they go after it big time with guys that have done the same thing. And so major, major anal sex. And I can tell you some guys, you know, you know, five, 10 partners a week. I've reviewed it on my Substack, loaded with syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, loaded. And on, on top of that, you know, there's a there's papers, one out of Chicago uh, about human papilloma virus. They're loaded with HPV. And the vaccine doesn't even work. Even if they take the vaccine, it's just there's so much sexual context. So what we have in the adult male gay population is just a gaming of Obamacare and a big gay kink. That's what's going on. Right. So, so it's, it's, it, it's a fetish. For it's, certain a fetish. It's, it's a fetish. It's a fantasy. And uh, so that's so if you ever go, if you want to really kind of see what's in Twitter, go to hashtag she male or femboy or there's a zillion of them like this, and you're going to see wide open men who have breast implants having anal sex with other men that just look like them. Now, here's the unfair part about this. So if they do this and they have fully uh, functional male genitalia, a lot of them haven't even taken hormones, and they declare they're women, they're competing in men's sports <laughs> and, and, and winning. They're, they're going to female restrooms. So what people have said is what really what counts. You yeah, what really counts sports. is... Yeah, May, what's really counts is what's below the belt. If there's a normal yes. penis and testicles below the belt, it's a guy and shouldn't be there. Now, if these guys want to get castrated as adults and take hormones and have the penile surgery, then they can kind of be in their own special Olympic category. I don't think I don't think these guys could even ride a bike after that. Um, I, so I think it's the DNA that counts. 
And if you well, are well, an adult and you're doing hormones, and I still think once you're developed as well, a male, I, it matters, then you well, can do know, your own know. special it, it category, be, right? Agreed, yeah. agreed. It should be gender assignment at birth. But what I'm saying is, you know, just because a man gets breast implants, or honestly, just because yeah. he changes his name to a girl's name, that doesn't, it, it's a fantasy. That It's a fantasy that they're a girl. They're not, they, they, you know, I recently got to know Miriam Grossman, who you should have her on your show. She's probably- I did. The, we did. Yeah, she's wonderful. And she tells you, listen, it's it's medically and, and scientifically impossible for a girl to be in a guy's body or vice versa. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, I mean, it, it really- yeah, it, I like. I, 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 like I probably to dial it back and look back. Just even putting it all in context yeah, we, to when we <laughs> grew up. I mean, this was not a, a thing when we went to medical school. You know, you'd hear of occasional, very strange case of someone doing this transgender. In our careers, I remember up until 2010, 2013, even two yep. men ever that I had seen. So doing family practice between both of us who had come into clinic and then it was a surprise because they needed a pap smear. And I was like, this is a guy, two cases. So between yep. the two of us doing this. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, and I was doing between four and 5,000 patient visits a year and may worked about half that. So we're talking, you know, 7,500. No, nothing in kids, nothing. Now I'm not talking about the gay community. I'm talking about full on transgender, wanting to transition, don't feel right. And then I would say, actually, I stand corrected. Then in 2010, I had a patient um, who she wanted to transition and started locally here in Oregon. There was a center up in Portland and they, they began the process binding and then the hormones and she wanted me to inject her. And I like, I refused because I didn't believe in it. And I got into actually a load of uh, crap from colleagues for not doing what my patient wanted. And I said, no, oh, then you can, t you can do that part of mm. her care. But, I, you know, right. I don't and, believe in this. So anyway. And what about the patient that wants 180 oxycodones every month? <laughs> right. We should just right. give them that. Too, so I declined right? to inject the testosterone. But that was three cases. And then all of a sudden, things switched. And, you know, we're working even urgent care. And all of a sudden, there's just a dramatic shift right before COVID. And up the surge goes where all of a sudden... It's like, well, I think I'm trans, it's girls, it's guys, but the number of girls is on the rise. And, you know, having talked to Miriam Grossman, it's not usually girls that have gender dysphoria that want to transition. It's usually the historical, uh, looking back at history, it's usually been men right. that want to transition. And so, you know, we talked about that with her. And I don't know about the autism side of things, but what I see from my own experience personally growing up as a, in medicine, just is that it's the new, um, there's no, you don't see anorexia and bulimia and surges as you did before. It's almost, is this replacing yes. this meant the mm -hmm. teenage distraught social anxiety you have, you fit in now because you're accepted if you're trans. Uh, everybody's confused when either a kid or a teenager, no girl likes to be a teenage girl. Who, I mean, it's a confusing time. It then there's all this spiritual stuff going on in the world. Well, but now you're, I and think, then you're stuck to this damn thing for 18 hours yeah. a day. So, so I, I think that it, there might be that element of autism. I really think it, it is the new uh, outlet for confused, distraught teenagers um, because their life stinks and they think this is the way that things will be better. I mean, but, but here's the difference, man. I know what you're saying it's kind of like a fad, right? So kind of like bell bottoms or eight track tape. That's, or gone, that's <laughs> gone crazy because the but, medical community is now pushing and supporting it. Well, and yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say is yeah. Yeah, I recognize there's fad diseases, but you know, the AMA saying we no longer put gender on the birth certificate, academic medical centers having tops clinics and bottoms clinics. This is more than a fad. This right. Is oh, some right. Type now of it is for mental sure. disturbia. This is really nuts. And, you know, in the Netherlands, they've been doing this about 15 years. This is really something is really off kilter now. No, I, no, I agree with that because look at um, my, I myself had anorexia as a high school teenage girl and through college. I mean, I, th I think what if someone had willingly, you know, gave me diet pills or, a gastric, a gastric bypass, bypass or, you know, <laughs> surgery to, to, uh, affirm my thoughts. I mean, are well, yeah, it's like what it, Jordan Peterson ridiculous. says, like no doctor affirms anything. 
you know, you affirm your patient as a human and as somebody, you know, that's obviously has a, a right to compassion and treatment and all this, but you don't, you don't go to the cancer clinic to get your cancer affirmed. You go there to get your cancer killed and ripped out of your body. But, 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 but remember, Tim, this is uh, with autism it's neuropsychiatric. So the words really do matter. So picking up on um, that maze analogy is you'd say, listen, if you had somebody with, with um, anorexia or nervosa, you wouldn't go up to him and say, you look fat. Right. I mean, right. Th th that could be right. a disaster. If you had a child with gender dysphoria, you wouldn't go up to him and say, listen, maybe you should change your genders. It's just as it's just as pathology driven. The words really do matter. Right. So, uh, you know, but, but Grossman really impressed me. She said, you know, she has this book. It's coming out called Trans New Word Nation. You've probably featured a trans nation and uh, it's going to be a guide for parents. And oh, what she yeah. says is that parents actually at a very young age have to actually affirm the gender in these little kids. You take a little boy and show him his genitalia and say, listen, you're a little boy. You're going to be a man. You're going to grow up like your dad. You're going to be a man. You're going to be a big, strong man. And the girl, the same thing. Look at you. You're going to be a beautiful woman. This is, and, and, and you actually have to do that because if the kids go in as little kids without getting some parental um, affirmation of who they are, they're going to actually get confused with all this wide open pornography that hits them K through 12. So my point too, I mean, I love that idea. And the whole thing, if you get to, well, now it's even earlier than puberty, but even I'm you know, thinking now puberty starting at age 10 and 11 in girls, uh, for a whole other reasons, we could go down that bunny trail. <laughs> yeah, enjoy but, enjoy uh, your hormone injected chicken kids. So yeah. when I, I don't know, is it part of the, Everybody needs a trophy movement, but the whole thing of when kids, you know, they're, they're struggling when they're 10, 11, 12, and I don't like feeling this way. When did we stop just saying, yes, sometimes it stinks to feel that way. It's okay to not be happy in your body because it's confusing. Um, instead of like, oh, I want to fix the problem. If you don't like your body or you don't like having your period now that you're 10 or 11, well, maybe maybe you shouldn't be a girl. Maybe you should be a guy. So you don't have to have your period because you hate it. And then it, you know, there's a time what I'm saying is, yes, you need to say you're going look at you are you are a five year old boy with this is a beautiful body. You're a five year old uh, little girl. You're going to grow up to be a beautiful woman. And when you go through the tough times, because they will come, we teach kids this is a tough time. It doesn't mean you're in the wrong body or you're the wrong person, even though you feel confused. You're still meant to be that sex, that gender. It's tough times. I mean, I remember going through that and. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, who would, who would want to go to school at 11 years old? Not, you know, you know, you're still a child, a reasonably young child. And all of a sudden your body just starts bleeding randomly. Like, why would anyone want to go through any of that kind of stuff? Why would you want to be the, the little girl that's 12 years old? That is the most sexually developed in the class and is getting made fun of by the girls and the boys. I get it. I mean, it, it puberty is horrible for males and females, but you know, women in this society, especially with social media, that is a very difficult time. You don't make a very good, difficult time better by chopping someone's breasts off. Somehow that does not compute right. to me. So then let's talk about the healthcare professionals that are like supporting this where I just, Oh, I get so angry inside. Well, I mean, like, like you say, there's probably a couple dozen, uh, you know, States that are banning, transgender medicine. I understand, I think today, Governor Abbott's finally signed some legislation to ban pornography in the schools. Um, you know, we've had to have laws do this. I mean, that's the interesting thing is, you know, we have to have laws. Otherwise, that all this hypersexuality and perversion will continue. Um, this Gay Pride Month is really uh, teaching us something. You know, all 193 flags at Rockefeller Center, of all the different countries in the world were replaced with a single gay pride flag at every flagpole uh, in, in the uh, in the capital, the centerpiece where the American flag is supposed to fly. Now it's the gay pride flag. And you're seeing them everywhere. I looked across the street at my neighbor. I don't know him very well. He just he built a house across the street. Also, there's a gay gay pride flag. It, it, uh, it It's absolutely everywhere. It's on people's emojis. It's coming up. Um, I recently testified in the Pennsylvania Senate. And uh, the Pennsylvania Senate Democrats changed their logo to the gay pride. Uh, the American Board of Internal Medicine, traditional blue 
uh, insignia changed their rainbow to a gay pride rainbow. This wasn't just for gay pride month. This happened a couple years ago. So it's just something has gone in the minds of people where there's gender fluidity. There is a hypersexuality. There's, it seems like a, a, an immorality of, of children. You know, some schools are starting sex clubs where the kids learn how to do oral sex on each other in elementary school after school. No, it's just, it, it, there's, there's some type of unmooring of, of, the, of, of humans' uh, ethical and moral uh, positions now. We're, we're in some type of new twilight zone, and it's happening quickly. Well, I, we openly would say that it's a very spiritually dark thing going on, for sure. Um, because whether you're, you know, so if you're 21 and you think you want to transition and you're an adult and you've made your decision, fine. But when have we like, what's all the hypersexuality of children in schools, the books, the clubs, like you're talking about? I mean, I feel like people need like a little dose of reality and smacked on the head. I mean, just if somebody wants to do that when they're an a, adult and make that decision, fine. But what we're doing to kids well, is insane. And so my thing is that health professionals who are pushing the surgeries, the hormone blockers, doing this to kids where we know it can have lifelong lasting consequences. Um, but yet you can't even get a tattoo until you're, well, I don't know how old, 16, 18, because Right. Our, because our, what? No, there's a great story. Our I son mean, was, our son was, it's, yeah, it's crazy. our son was about 11 and he came in and he said, dad, when I'm, and he had this really cute lisp when he's 11, he goes, dad, I'm, I know what I'm going to do when I'm 18. I'm going to get tattooed. And what it's going to be, it's going to be flames that go up both of my arms and then hot wheels across my chest. And then he says, why do you have to be 18 to get a tattoo? And I said, so you don't get flames up both arms and hot wheels across your chest. <laughs> That's why. But guess what? If you want to be Sally instead of Jake, We'll take care of that right away for you. Actually, you can just take care of it yourself. Tell your teacher you live in the state of Oregon. You don't even have to get consent from your parents. I mean, that is an insane clown world. Well, and, and, you know, you've heard the jokes like, so a kid's five and he wants to be a pirate, you know. So what do we cut out an eye and cut off a leg? I mean, I mean, it, it that's taking well, it to the let's extreme. Just talk but about, it's you know, let's talk about some of the details. So I have a firsthand report of something going on in the army, you know, the military. So there's a male soldier. So he's obviously over age 18 and he's decided he wants to be a woman. So he's uh, getting uh, breast implants. He's getting hair depolarization, getting all the hair taken out. He is, had his voice box changed. So the Adam's apple isn't as prominent. He's uh, taking hormones and, uh, and, you know, making himself look like a beautiful woman. And he's had, all these things going on. He hasn't been on duty for like five months. The military is paying for all this. It's our taxpayer dollars costing a fortune. We know that the digital ambassador for the Navy is a guy who dresses up as a cute girl. He's a trans, and yet he's the one advertising for the Navy. We know that um, a, a trans gender was just picked to be the main advertising for Anheuser-Busch, and that Targets launched a campaign that there's a rainbow version of the Ford Raptor. Uh, someone, someone just showed me a Starbucks cup and it says we're hiring now and our insurance covers transgender surgeries and things like this. So, uh, I mean, what's going on appears to be a centrally orchestrated campaign uh, that is just sweeping through uh, American culture, like we've never seen before. Well, well it, it's just like I, I just think of the military side, and and I I just envision, uh, uh, G and Putin sitting together, you know, clinking vodka glasses, laughing themselves to sleep. They're so drunk and happy because it's like well, you know, if we're if we're, con I mean, the military's job's really simple, and I don't care if you're a male, female, whatever. It's to kill people and break things, and hopefully, our civilian leadership tells you to break the right things and kill the right people. Other than that, it should be entirely apolitical. That's it. My, I honestly though, I just think really when it comes down to it, having seen in the last couple of years, so many, um, I'm thinking of a few cases of transgender transitioning people that have uh, done the hormones, the surgery, and a couple of patients come to mind. When you meet with 
these people one on one. They're the ones really that are suffering. Almost all of them are on multiple psychiatric medications. Yeah. When they come in for a, a medical problem, um, there's always that underlying issue with their their anxiety and depression and a psychiatric overlay. And I, my heart, I mean, we get mad and make fun about all this stuff, but honestly, my heart breaks for the person that is this confused and that's being supported and medical, having medical people push them into doing something that might not be the right decision. And it's the poor patient, this trans person that is caught up in this and they're we know the data that actually you're right. The suicides and depression is not, this is not fixing it. And one-on-one -on -one when you meet with them, like my heart breaks for these people because they've been told a lie, but now for so many of them, they're so far gone into this. You're right. It's not reversible. They're stuck. And um, it's just sad. I mean, I, I feel for them if when you're like Tim and I've talked about it, if you're that broke, broken mentally and emotionally that you have to cut off your genitalia, inject yourself with these medications because you're searching for hope or you think your life is better by completely physically altering your body, becoming a different kind of human. I mean, that's a tough place to be in. And then well, I can't when, even, we, when we see them in yeah, clinic, I mean, I, I they're, can't not they're not happier. I can't comprehend that level of distress. And that's why, that's why we have so much distaste and anger for the, the people pushing this. Um, I, I mean, it just seems so unbelievably devoid of any compassion for what's really going on. But, you know, all the major medical societies are on board, American College of Sexual Gynecology, American uh, AMA, all the other societies. And, you know, you intimated that Putin and North Korea would be laughing. But guess what? Putin just had to take action to outlaw it in Russia. <laughs> so uh, yeah. my wife and I went to India recently and we are in Delhi. And on cars, really crowded streets. You've been over there, you know, it's super crowded. And uh, suddenly we're stopped in traffic. We were just stuck. And then all the cars were swarmed by all these beautiful women wearing these bright dresses and makeup and all that. We were saying, wow, look at all these beautiful women. And they got really close to the car. Well, my wife said, they're not women. <laughs> they were men. So, so let me tell you, it, it's transgender all over the world at the same time. So whatever's going on, it's in the minds of people to lose their minds over whether or not they're a man or a woman. It's happening simultaneously. And it, it, it is almost out of this world what's happening. You can't imagine that it's Twitter doing this or the World Economic Forum doing this or Yuval Harari or whatever. This is, this is widespread. It's happening everywhere simultaneously. So what are we hmm. left with? What do we do? Those who don't, I mean, honestly, I think that those of us who think we're doing a modern day lobotomy on people, um, you know, yes. we thought the lobotomy was going to cure people's well, mental the guy illness. That, yeah. I mean, was it 1943? The guy that came up with the lobotomy won the Nobel prize, you know, American medicine, the state of the art in uh, the early 1900s was uh, eugenics, which was sterilizing, you know, people that were seemed, you know, deemed unfit, which of course were, you know, black people was, high on the list as well as, you know, mental defectives. And uh, yeah, but who got to judge who was mentally defective, right? I mean, it's just, you know, this kind of insanity and inhumanity to man has been going on in the name of the medical profession and the science for as long as there was people doing this job. And that, I mean, I honestly feel, I'm like, this is what man and I are, I don't, I mean, I don't know if it's, I mean, if we were, what effect we're having, I know I've had some friends just floored at the interviews we've got we've been so privileged to talk to people like yourself but it's just we feel like we have to be beating this drum until like our our hands bleed and we can't beat it anymore because it's so crazy i'm so unbelievably disappointed and angry with my own profession it just makes me well but well, you know we, it's interesting that the same people who suppressed early treatment that is you know the mainstream media the orthodoxy of medicine are the same people who promoted the COVID-19 vaccines. And they're the same people who've pivoted over to fully support this transgender omania. And, uh, you know, I can tell you at, at this point in time, you know, with COVID, people could say it was an emergency. Americans were dying. We didn't know what to do. We're scared. Well, I can tell you, this is different. There's no gender emergency. No. It, it didn't just, there's no emergency. We, we can slow down. 
we can think this through. We can talk about this. We can, we got to talk this through. Uh, you know, this just came out of nowhere and it's absolutely on fire right now. I wanted to point out the relationship between transgenderism and violence. And mm -hmm. uh, do you know that there's a paper by Mendez and colleagues? This is stunning. Over 2,000 homicides, largely where the transgender are the victims. And about 80% are men, 80% of the perpetrators are men, and 40% of the time they know each other. And uh, we've seen now mass murders. You know, the one in Nashville? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a transgender uh, woman who was on male hormones, almost certainly, that, you know, had a psychotic break and, and shot. A, a, Imagine you know, that, this. all that testosterone. Hmm. Right. So, so uh, in a recent uh, paper that would come out on my Substack, I reviewed the, um, the hormones for men and women. And largely in this, it was a study uh, out of Portugal. And the, the, the peak age that people were doing is age 16. So they're post pubertal So they're either getting straight androgens or straight estrogens, depending on what the change is. Do you know, 89% of the time they were sick taking these hormones. It makes sense. You know, you're a normal male at, at age 16. You have a lot of testosterone. Well, start taking estrogens. You're going to feel sick. Mm -hmm. Just like a woman, she has her normal uh, phases of menstruation. Start taking testosterone. She's going to feel sick. So mood swings, acne, um, uh, sleeplessness, you know, on and on and on. It is not a feel good situation to take these hormones. And I was so impressed with the side effects. And it makes sense. You're going against mother nature with hormones. You're going to get sick. Oh, even when you go with mother nature, um, I mean, just there's total data on <laughs> there you, can give be chaos. Women, you give women a birth control pill. A lot of them don't react well. They, you know, mm -hmm. you upset their natural balance to try to prevent pregnancy with the hormone. They feel terrible. We know this in PCOS, um, postmenopausal management of hormones, giving them, there's can be all kinds of fluctuations. It's like, oh, I don't feel good as you're trying to balance things. So even when you're doing same sex hormone replacement, it can be, it's very like fine cooking, let alone when you're yes. pushing opposite those sex hormones in some, someone. I mean, so I think we have kind of two emerging. One is the adult gay men who are getting breast implants. They seem to be having a lot of enjoyment with their sex. You can see it, you know, all day long on Twitter and what have you. So, you know, their, their sexual function is just fine, but you have the younger people who have actually done something. So when the man has his penis filleted open and then inverted to make a vagina, has the testicles removed. Uh, you know, th that surgery, there's more complications than there are surgeries. Almost everyone needs revisions. There's, there's, uh, you know, there's a ureteral, um, uh, urethral to cutaneous fistulas, uh, infections, uh, and, and there's no suggestion that there's any sexual enhancement or function there. So that's just that's a lost cause. On the woman's side, this phalloplasty, these uh, these kind of sausage-like peanuts carved uh, penises carved out of the uh, thigh, they're non-functional. They can't get any erection. They try to put some type of prosthesis in there. It can't really do anything. Uh, the metidioplasty is just trying to make a clitoris um, a little bit bigger. It, it's so small, it can't do anything anyway. So I think what people are doing in the end is they're actually removing any sexual pleasure it, it that it almost it would almost be similar to becoming like a eunuch and uh so there is no sexual pleasure and it just it has to be a miserable existence i noticed uh, on the social media there was a prominent uh, social media influencer and it was i believe a girl that went to a guy and that uh, wants to transition back i, I noticed and it, and i i noticed in the vignette she has autism. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it, it, oh, it's just, it's, it just makes us really, well, really sad. I mean, even um, another bunny trail is then I've seen some of them where they're actually, they're trans and now they're kindergarten teachers. And then they go in there and push the agenda on our kids. And I mean, it is. Oh, that's another thing that, uh, that Grossman really <laughs> impressed me on. Have you seen these uh, drag queen festival videos? Big here in Oregon, big in Oregon. Yeah. 
So, so what she said is you take a child age zero to let's say 10 at the, at the biggest expanse and they get exposed to that. They see a man dancing around with bright colors and his genitalia all over and he's acting in, in just crazy, bizarre, hypersexual you know, gesticulations. That event causes a permanent imprinting of the young mind. It can't be re erased. It cannot be erased. And so that's permanently damaging. Just one damages the kids. So going to one of these gay parades or, or drag queen things. And what Grossman says is you can't allow that to happen as a parent. You can't. It's just, you know, it's just as bad as, as seeing a child see some horrendous, uh, you know, violent act or something. You just can't do it because it permanently imprints the brain. And, and yet it's happening now. Why would drag queens want to do this at elementary schools to begin with? And why, why would parents would support parents, it? Yeah. Why would parents take their kids there? Is this, I mean, we didn't, you know, you're busy enough with soccer and with cheerleading and everything else. What, 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 what you know, what would motivate people to do that? that? That's the reason why, Tim, I tend to side with May on this. I think something very big is happening that's way bigger than anything we can possibly contemplate. And it is spiritual and it is lining up of, of good versus evil. I, I I can't agree with you more. I mean, the first time we did, we spoke, which was I think June of twenty one, you know, we kind of you know ended the conversation, which is I think there's something else. You know, there's uh, there's clouds on the horizon. You can kind of hear the the gathering hoof beats, as the case may be. Now it's like, yeah, I think the horses just ran by, and yeah. it it really, I mean, it re it really is more than just disturbing, and it's so completely counter to common sense. And that's why, you know, we have this show that we do on Wednesday nights called Doctails with Cocktails, which is lighter and kind of funny. And I think honestly, one of the things that we can do is when you see something insane, you cannot, you cannot really rationalize with insanity. It doesn't work. So I kind of agree with JP Sears that the next step is to make fun of it. Yeah. Because because it almost is more effective at getting your message across. Yeah. Like it's so ridiculous. Like this, we we featured a case where this guy was was charged with indecent exposure, and they threw the charges out because he was so fat it hit all of his genitals. <laughs> For real. For real. So he was going into the YMCA, yeah. into the girls' change room, and he got he the, the, the his and lawyer these said teenage girls are saying we're we're yeah. we're feeling assaulted, and the judge said no, his fat blocked his penis, so therefore you you couldn't have been offended. Yeah, he probably had like a little a little, a little <laughs> snub of a wiener, you know, it just got covered up. When you, when you're that fat, you have a lot of circulating estrogens, kind of shrinks the penis. exactly. <laughs> it's exactly right. <laughs> but I'm just like. Uh, it was funny and we made fun of it, but then I'll, but I it's get just so I'm unbelievable. Like, standing up for these poor girls. Well, and like, I mean, aren't your, aren't your kids fully grown now? Yes. Yeah, they are. Yeah. So my kids yeah. are fully grown and you know, my son just got married. My daughter's uh, is not married, but she's, you know, she's a, a successful attorney and um, you know, I don't have any fears of their gender uh, identities and stuff, but I got to tell you, if I was a young parent today, with the pornography flooding in. The, the problem is the parents don't control your kids every day, right? They go off to school right. they are with their friends. And, and I know some very, very decent young parents. They are scared to death. They're thinking about homeschooling. I mean, they're making radical changes right now because of this tsunami of hypersexuality, pornography, and transgenderism. Well, all I could say is I hope that more healthcare professionals like you, like us, start speaking out we're going to have another guest on that's a therapist that has i hope more like-minded people speak out and parents and everyone start standing up to you know your school boards um healthcare providers everyone because that's the only way to really impact any change so it, so we're know, getting it may be the same group we may be the same ones the ones who treated covid and we were skeptical on the covid vaccines we may be the same ones well, for, because the mainstream is all in on this it seems yeah. to be that way from our uh, observations. It, 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 yeah, it, it sure does. I mean, when, when, the, we, the last corporate job we had, the, the guy, you know, the, the chief medical officer had a full beard, was married to a woman with, you know, three kids that were in middle school and high school. And he had he, him pronouns on every, you know, message he sent us. I'm like, 
that is i'm sorry i like it just makes me i, I well, we don't do corporate this, medicine I, I anymore. That's quick thing yet because I have to get off. But yeah, I went to um, University of Texas Dallas event to honor Senator Bob Hall. It's in Richardson, it's just south of where I'm right now. I'm in McKinney. And um, anyhow, right next door to us, we are having our event in one of the big meeting rooms in the alumni center. They were having an alumni event for for donors, typically older, you know, wealthy donors. And the main faculty member leading it was probably about a six foot man. He was dressed in a purple dress with makeup and and hair, and he was dressed up as like a woman. And all the alumni were just taking notes. They were saying mm-hmm. they were they were taking him as like matter of fact. <laughs> My wife and I were like, "This is nuts!" That they they they, they like I would be laughing. I mean, it's just it, it it looked so odd, and yet everyone was just accepting it. It's just so wild. So as we wrap this up, where can people find you? I know your Substack is Courageous Discourse, and it's awesome because it's a two-for-one deal. You get the mighty and powerful Peter McCullough as well as John Leake. So you get a historical perspective as well as a very well-researched medical Mm -hmm. perspective in that Substack. Um, If you don't know what Substack is, you're missing out. It is a great place to get a lot of really good knowledge. So where else can can our listeners find you? It's true. Substack is really now the new uh, independent media. It's absolutely wonderful. I subscribe to about five or six of them myself and very affordable. I think like five dollars a month. Um, But uh, go to my website, Peter McCullough, MD. That'll take you everywhere. I've still got the McCullough Report on America Loud Talk Radio, 2 p.m. Eastern, Saturday and Sunday podcast network. After that, bring on great guests from all over. Uh, Grossman, Marion Grossman will be featured shortly. Um, I uh, have a, a TV show I'm starting with John Leake in Dallas. AFN Networks is called A Second Opinion. It's an investigative TV show. Uh, we're shooting our episodes right now. It takes a lot of work. Hey, it's hard to be a movie star. Let me tell you what, it's, it's really tough. But you know what? The big news is our book, Courage to Face COVID-19, it could be a major motion picture. Yeah. And I'll keep it up. I'm not going to tell you who's going to play me, but you're going to be amazed if it works out. And so this is going to be really exciting. Uh, I, I was fired twice from my job. I'm honored to say that uh, two jobs yeah. uh, down at the major medical center in Dallas, which go unnamed. So now I'm in completely independent medical practice. I've disenrolled from all the insurances and Medicare. I'm free and I'm busier than I've ever been before. I've seen patients. I'm very busy in research. We have manuscripts going writing groups. So I've made complete transition now. And uh, I'm very happy. Uh, just like you, I'm happy because I'm comfortable with myself. And I'm comfortable comfortable with the, with the notion that I do have a grip over reality, and that I know what truth is. And I have a, a sense, a real sense now, I know what right and wrong is. And I know we're on the right side of these arguments. I am, I sleep very well at night knowing that we are doing what's right, what's just, and what's moral. And what we're seeing on the other side of this is an absolute decay, an erosion of human ethics, morals, and uh, and of clinical medicine crumbling as we see it. Well, amen to that. And we are so happy for you that, you know, you have right. got all this going on and support behind you. And uh, we yeah, are just- so thankful to have... Have you pop in? Yeah, thank you so much. And if you need a couple dopey country doctors that like to make jokes (laughs) once in a while on any of your shows, we can probably find a couple. Oh, we should have you come on, do a fun one. Okay, listen, I got to go, you guys. Outstanding. Thank you again, again. Peter. Yeah. Good to see you. Okay, well, the roller coaster has uh, come back into the little station. And uh, what are we going to do with this information, which... uh, I think is presented as always, he's so erudite. And as I was ranting away about, you know, this and that, he's like, Tim, but what's the evidence? What's the evidence? He always comes back to that. Yeah. And it's really, really powerful. The other thing that really grabbed me about this interview is how happy he is. I know, right? He is the happy warrior. He is in this place. He's not pissed. He's not angry. He's motivated. He's passionate. And again, I, if we're going to change hearts and minds of people to really think about what's gone on in the last year, we need happy warriors. We don't need scorched earth policy. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Yeah. There, I mean, he's definitely in a better place. But the thing is, he knows what he believes. He knows he knows what truth is to him. And he's settled in that confidence. And uh, 
you know, he's not the unhappy, offended, pissed off person, which shows. Um, so that, as, as we talked about before, truth and love really touches people in a better way than, than I believe than being the angry, ticked off, trying to push your agenda on people um, because that just does nothing but push people away. Um, so lots to think about in that episode, honestly. I mean, obviously you can tell what we believe, but um, I think it's important for people to really question mainstream narrative a uh, lot. As we always say, as scientists, think critically about information that you're presented with both sides, even if it's somebody you trust and like, because sometimes our friends go down bunny trails that I don't agree with as well. And same with you, Tim. Yeah, but, that, <laughs> but that's fun. And 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 it's informative and it makes you think. And, and there's just a lack of thinking. You know, I think about I, I've been thinking about this a long time is that some technologies we develop are really good and they work really well till they don't. It, it's like processed food solved in a major problem, which was rotten food. Rotten food was way more dangerous and foodborne illness was a real problem and killed tons of people. And then we got processed food. Now we didn't have rotten food. So we had less disease, a less, less acute illness, less death until we got chronic illness from processed food. And then we have, and so it worked until it didn't work. And I think there's lots of stuff we need to question. You know, antibiotics work in certain situations till they don't, until we kill off the microbiome in every mammal, mammal in humanity and in, um, in the world and in the ecosystem. So there's lots of these things to think about. Stuff works till it doesn't. We used to x-ray. My brother is old enough to remember going to the shoe store and standing in their little super leaky high radiation x-ray machine to see oh if God. your shoes fit we have the new we have the new technology we'll we'll make sure your little boy shoot you know shoes fit perfect as we absolutely er eradicate his testicles with radiation stuff works till we figure out a better way and then it doesn't work anymore we have to continue questioning questioning we have to question the experts this is not a religion this so, is science. To put a lighter spin on it, are you uh, in the questioning camp? No, I just get my, um, my every time I buy a pair of running shoes, I get irradiated. Uh, of gotcha. course. What do you think? <laughs> just putting a cue on the, I, I, the questioning. I came out of the womb <laughs> looking at the doctor going, are you sure that you're doing this right? Uh, that's you. And then you all know it. So thanks for sticking us with us this week. Um, please share this episode with Dr. Peter McCullough. Don't forget our weekly Doc Tales live streaming on Facebook and YouTube, where you get to be part of the party every Wednesday. And please um, like and share our podcast and sign up for our newsletter, Truth Serum, and um, read some extra tidbits of fun that we've got writing and coming your way. Uh, see you guys all next week. It's no secret that medicine is a bit um, uptight. That's why Tim and I created BS Free MD to mix things up a little and have fun in the process. Besides, we are having these exact same discussions all the time, so we thought we might as well invite everyone to the party. If you really like us, you can get plenty more and maybe see one of Tim's cool tattoos on our Instagram or Facebook pages at BS Free MD. See you next time. But we try to keep BS Free MD as raw and real as possible. We can't be held responsible for any medical decisions or discussions had as a result of what you've heard on the show. We know, bummer. But the truth is, we really do care about your questions. So feel free to reach out to us by email at doc at bsfreemd.com.